Hey, Chris. Hello again, everyone. I am Chris Scher, and this is the Citizen Sports Weekly for Friday, April 2nd, 2021. Robert Hardy, Justin Ritzel with me. Day after April Fools, we won't be doing any type of foolish type antics or anything like that. We're being serious here. We're talking sports, and we've got a very, very busy show. We, we took yet last week off. Robert was on vacation, a much well-deserved vacation, so we took the week off. So we have uh, four great sports topics to get into. We'll start right off the bat, unintended, with Major League Baseball. The season started yesterday. It was fun. Auburn's own Tim LaCastro had his first home run of the season in the first game. But we're going to do some predictions, and we're going to talk a little bit about the All-Star game. This is breaking news. The All-Star game is being moved from Atlanta by Major League Baseball. So we'll get into our predictions first. I'll go through mine pretty quickly. I've got the Yankees winning the AL East. I've got the Twins winning the Central. I've got the Houston Astros winning the West. I've got Tampa Bay for my wild card. And then for the National League, I've got the Braves winning the East, the Brewers edging out the Cardinals in the Central. I've got the Dodgers winning the West. And for my wild card, I've got San Diego. And for the World Series, it's the classic Yankees-Dodgers World Series. And call me crazy, I think the Dodgers repeat as World Series champions. They, uh, you know, they finally got that, got that big burden off their shoulders last year when they won the series. I think it, it lifts a lot off them. They're going to repeat. So I like the Dodgers over the Yankees for the World Series. Robert, your predictions. Jeez, this, this guy can't resist a front runner. My goodness. Um, in, the, in the AL East, I, I have the Yankees winning it. Uh, I've got the White Sox coming out of the Central. That, that's going to be a tough one. Uh, I think the White Sox and Twins are going to be pretty good teams this year. But the White Sox, a good young team. You got that drunk La Russa running the show. <laughs> so, so maybe uh, maybe, maybe they can uh, uh, put, put it all together with, with his uh, expertise and, uh, and, and win that division. Uh, and the AL West, I got the A's. I, I think it's going to be tough for – anybody in that division really to compete with the A's, you know, the Astros are, you know, they've had some key pieces leave. So, you know, I, I don't think they will be as competitive this year on the NL side of things. I got the Braves winning the NL East. That should be a competitive division. Got the Cardinals coming out of the central. Uh, the Dodgers will win the West. Uh, my wildcard teams in each division or in each league, rather uh, I've got the twins, uh, and the Blue Jays uh, don't sleep. Don't sleep on the Blue Jays this year because that team's got some pretty good talent on there, uh, and I think that they can put it all together uh, and really um, make a good run here. You know, we we saw that a little bit yesterday with the Blue Jays beating the Yankees. So uh, I think I think you'll see them remain competitive uh, throughout the season. And then in the NL, uh, the Padres with the uh, with the Nationals. I'm not buying this hype around the Mets, you know, even though we've got people emailing us saying that, you know, we should be running, a, you know, an article every day about the Mets. Look, you know, they have to prove it on the field first. I get that, you know, that Lindor contract sent a tingle up their leg, but they haven't done anything in 35 years. Uh, call it the curse, uh, Harding's curse, because the last time they won a pennant was when I was born. So, the yeah, whoa, whoa, so whoa. they won the they won the pennant in 2015, or they won the World yeah. Series, rather. Right, I mean, win the World Series was 1986. Yes. Yeah, yeah. All right, all right, all right. Easy there. We, you know, we've dabbed oh, okay. their tears out. I, I, I check so, you, and that's what I get. Okay. <laughs> so my World Series, you know, I look, I, uh, I, it's very tough to repeat in every sport, and baseball's no exception. You know, the Dodgers are loaded up. I think they'll make another run at it, but this ain't a 60 game season. This is 162 and, you know, they're bound to choke at the end of this. Uh, it's like a three course meal for them. They can only have a snack, not this long of a meal. So I don't see them getting back to the world series, my world series, white Sox out of the AL and the Padres out of the NL Padres have a very good team this year. And believe it or not, I'm going to take the Padres to win it all in seven games this year. I, you know, I, I love the way you slam Tony La Russa, then you pick his team to win the pennant, which is hilarious. Because usually when it comes to uh, – He's a drunk. 
older, older. I, I, I didn't, I didn't say he was a bad manager, but he's, he's a drunk. Had, yes. He's had, obviously he's had multiple arrests for alcohol related driving incidents. Yes, that is true. Uh, I just, it's, you know, wherever he was hired, there was all this talk that he couldn't relate to today's players and social justice and everything, but obviously- well, look, I, I didn't, I didn't pick the white Sox because they brought back La Russa out of the nineties. I, I picked the white Sox because they have a pretty good team. And, you know, you look from top to bottom, there's a lot of talent on that team. Uh, former double day, Lucas Giolito is their ace. Uh, you're welcome from a nationals fan for, for Giolito. Uh, he's one of the top pitchers in the AL, I think. Uh, and they've got, they've got plenty of good bats on that team. Jose Abreu, you know, Tim Anderson, you know, that's a good team. Forget about La Russa. I'm looking at the talent on that team and I think they're going to be a, a contender this year. Justin, go ahead. Well, I'll start with the American league. I have the New York Yankees winning the American league or the, uh, the AL East. Uh, I, I think, one, you know, the Yankees, they've made the playoffs pretty much every year, but every single season they seem to be doomed by injuries. Aaron Judge hasn't played a full season in what seems like forever. Uh, when he's right, he's one of the you know, best hitters in the American League. Um, I, I, I just think that luck has got to turn around for the Yankees. I don't necessarily trust the rotation. They do have an ace at the top, and they took a lot of dart throws after him with Corey Kluber and Jamison uh, Talon uh, after him. I just think that even if those dart throws don't necessarily work out, I think the Yankees will make moves at the deadline to improve that roster because they do have one of the best rosters in, in the AL. They just need to stay healthy. Uh, like Robert, I like the White Sox in, in the AL Central, uh, a young up and coming team uh, that I think is ready to take the next step. And the disrespect for my Los Angeles Angels in the AL West. Joe Madden has never had back-to-back -back losing seasons in his long career as a manager. Uh, and I think that's going to continue. Their lineup is as good as any lineup in the American League. And they were one of the teams last year that really got hurt by the 60-game season because, you know, there's a lot of moving pieces. Again, new manager coming in. And they really started to pick up steam in the second half. And I think if that's 162 game season, I think they grab one of those, those wild card spots for sure. Just wasn't in the cards for them last year, but uh, not necessarily a great rotation, but I think it has the potential to be uh, one of the better AL rotations if everything goes well. And they have the ultimate X factor, Otani. Uh, I wouldn't bet on him staying healthy. He hasn't pitched at all really in the last four years since coming to the major leagues, but he can really honestly swing the entire American league. If he even comes close to the potential he has. So I like the angels in the AL West, my wild card teams. Uh, I like the A's as well. The first wild card team. And maybe this is a bit of a surprise. I like the blue Jays kind of in the same mold as the white Sox, young up and coming team. Uh, I don't really love their pitching, but I think Vlad Guerrero Jr. is going to bounce back and he's going to kind of live up to that promise as, you know, he was one of the best prospects in baseball a couple of years ago. And uh, I, I like the way he's been, uh, he's been swinging the bat uh, through spring training and got off to a nice start yesterday. National League, it's not a sexy pick. I like the Braves in the East. Uh, Cardinals uh, adding uh, Nolan uh, Arenado from, from the Rockies. Uh, I think that's a big move. And then Dodgers in the West, uh, no brainer there. I think I got the Padres and uh, our friend Jeremy Boyer's Phillies as the uh, two wild card teams. The Phillies have a good roster. They just need an average bullpen. Like their bullpen stunk last year. Uh, if they get any semblance of a, a decent performance from their bullpen, they 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 could compete with anybody. Um, my World Series, I like the Padres to beat the New York Yankees. Um, no rhyme or reason to it. Padres are an exciting team. I like the rotation. I think that ultimately is kind of what wins you games in the postseason. Dodgers are a great roster, no doubt. Uh, I have them picking the, the West for a reason, but uh, I think that they are a veteran group. They're an older group. And like Robert said, it's tough to go back to back, even though they did have a shortened season last year. Um, so I, I like the Padres probably to beat the Dodgers in the NLCS and beat the Yankees. 
I uh, forgot to mention two of my wild cards, one in each league, White Sox and Cardinals, by the way. Sorry about that. So, all right. So, as I alluded to earlier, baseball, Major League Baseball is moving the All-Star game out of Atlanta uh, because of changes to voting laws in the state of Georgia. And my, my feelings are basically is Major League Baseball is a private business. They can do their business wherever they want. If they want to pull the All-Star game out of Atlanta and Georgia, that is their prerogative. They can do that. If people don't like it, oh, well, don't watch the game. Don't patronize Major League Baseball. That's your right as a customer or consumer. You can take your business elsewhere, root for another sport, whatever. Um, but I don't blame Major League Baseball. I think there's going to be – this is the first of many uh, – of businesses, private business that are, are going to change the way they do business in the state of Georgia over this. And you can debate whether these voting rule changes uh, are good or bad. Uh, you can make points, I think, for both in some ways, but it is Major League Baseball's right to do what they feel is best, and that's what they're doing. Justin, your thoughts. The first thing I thought of when, when this news broke was all the heroes over the last few years who keep saying, stick to sports, don't talk about politics, stick to sports. And as I've said since day one, it is impossible to separate the two, especially in this day and age. Politics and sports have intersected in a way where you cannot ignore one side of it. And this is just the latest example of that. I never shy away from taking shots at Major League Baseball and Rob Manfred, but I think for once they did get something right. Uh, Major League Baseball obviously has had a problem with uh, the amount of African Americans that play baseball, that, that make it to the major leagues. It's, it's a shrinking number of players, but a lot of these players that are Hispanic that play in the league, uh, I'm sure they deal with a lot of the same problems because of the color of their skin. And I think these policies, you know, not to get super political, uh, I don't know if this is necessarily the time for that, but these policies, these, these voting rules that Georgia's implemented affects everyone of color. It's specifically targeted to limit their ability to vote and, you know, limit everyone's ability to vote. And that's not a good thing. So uh, hopefully Georgia gets the message. This is a big draw. You know, the All-Star Game is a huge event that brings uh, tourists into the state. It brings money into the state for whoever hosts the game every year. And hopefully the message gets received. This is, this is a big thing for MLB. I applaud them for taking this step, uh, and I hope it doesn't stop here. Robert. Well, th this, this, this is obviously a little in my, in my wheelhouse. Um, you know, one thing I'll say about this is that you know, there, there's been a lot of different takes about this new voting law. And, and by no means am I trying to downplay its, uh, you know, clear intent. But, you know, I think that there's been a lot of information that's been lost, especially in the translation done by uh, cable news outlets and the pundits and everyone who has a hot take about this that uh, that's actually, you know, it's, it makes it confusing as to what the law actually does. And I'm not going to get into that here, but just to say that, you know, I think people, you know, need to, to do their due diligence. You know, the New York Times, for example, has a great piece about this, which, you know, I think addresses some of the misinformation out there from both critics of it and supporters of it uh, to, to really address it. But I think really what this is about is that, it's not so much about the law itself, it's what, what was the driving force behind it. And of course, we saw what happened with the 2020 election that uh, Joe Biden narrowly won in Georgia over Donald Trump. Uh, this has been a thorn in Trump's side and his supporters' side for months now. Uh, when you look at uh, the, all the states that Biden won, uh, these battleground states, Georgia is the one where Trump has focused a lot of his criticism. And so, you know, this law comes out, I think, you know, in response to that criticism, they want to try and right or wrong, if you will, and they come out with this product. Uh, and I think that that's really where you see a lot of the reaction to it is, 
are the motives behind it. Uh, you know, the MLB is responding to, uh, to, to the criticism of this law. Uh, you know, I, I think Stacey Abrams, who, you know, it was a huge factor in the Democrats' performance uh, in the 2020 election, she came out and said, don't boycott Georgia. Uh, and I, I think that's something that you have to keep in mind is that while this is a political statement of sorts for MLB, uh, it does have far reaching effects. You know, Ritz mentioned, you know, what an all-star game brings with it. Uh, and, you know, this is gonna be a significant hit, especially in a place like Georgia, you know, the businesses uh, in the pandemic, uh, an all-star game could have given them a boost you know, the bars, the restaurants, hotels, you know, having something like that there uh, would have been an economic boon. But, you know, now the MLB is moving on. Um, I get the reasoning, but I think that if, uh, I, I think it'll be more punitive than they realize to people who could really use this, especially the workers, you know, the business owners that are, you know, kind of collateral damage here uh, because not only of what Georgia leaders did, but now the actions of the MLB. Uh, it's unfortunate, but, you know, hopefully they'll get back to Atlanta soon. And hopefully we get, you know, some correct information out about this law, because I'm not saying that it's perfect by any means. Um, you know, there's people who view it, you know, it's all bad. Uh, and there's people who act like, you know, it's no big deal. It's somewhere in the middle. It's not it's not great, you know, in some areas, but it's not as bad in some others. Uh, and I think that, you know, people really need to do their due diligence to, to read up on it before they make any judgments or at least be informed about the judgments that they make. It'll be interesting what happens the next time the Super Bowl is uh, awarded, because I don't know whether Atlanta's got one coming in the near future, but you wonder if this would have an impact, because I know uh, that uh, Arthur Blank, the owner of the Falcon, the Atlanta Falcons, has, uh, has said some things against this. So it'll be interesting to see uh, how this impacts the, the, you know, eventually the NFL down the road. So, all right, you guys ready to move on to our next topic? Sure. Final four is tomorrow. It's just been weird. I mean, obviously the pandemic affecting the, the NCAA tournament with the games with a limited amount of fans and no fans close to the court and everything looking very different and everything and all the games being in Indiana, it's not your typical NCAA tournament. Um, and then obviously Syracuse getting eliminated kind of killed some of the local interest in it. But, you know, I think for me, the biggest, my biggest pet peeve with the NCAA tournament is just the fact that they changed the days that the games were on. I mean, having elite eight games on Monday and Tuesday and 10, and 10 PM Eastern starts was just stupid. Okay, I get some of these games involved West Coast teams, but 10 o'clock starts. I'm sorry, man. That's way too late for the East Coast. I mean, I don't know what was wrong with the old Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday schedule. But anyways, at least the Final Four is on a Saturday again. Gonzaga, look, they're going to mop up the floor with UCLA. UCLA might hang with them a little bit. Come on, Gonzaga's good. They're going to win this thing overall. We all know that. For the other game, I like Houston to beat Baylor. I, I look, Houston has got a very good defense. Look what they did to Syracuse. They have, they've been rolling through everybody. I think Houston pulls off the surprise beat Baylor. I think it's Gonzaga Houston, but I think Gonzaga is going to win the title. So Robert, your, uh, your picks for the final four. Yeah. I Gonzaga is a juggernaut. Uh, they have lived up. They, they've really been, I think, the only team you, you might be able to put Baylor in this conversation a little bit, but Gonzaga for sure is, is really the team that's lived up to uh, lived up to their potential in this tournament. You know, there've been a lot of disappointments along the way, but Gonzaga's just played incredible basketball. Uh, and, you know, they've, they've really had a dominating performance so far. I, I think they should win easily over UCLA uh, UCLA is lucky to be in this position. Michigan really blew it in that game. Uh, you know, U UCLA won it fair and square. I'm not going to take anything away from them, but Michigan really threw that away and should have been playing in this, in this final four game. On the other side, look, you know, I give Houston credit for their defense. That's going to, that's going to be a problem no matter what team you play, but 
you know, they, they've also had the benefit of playing some real dogs in this tournament and Baylor's no dog. Okay. Baylor is, you know, that if, if Gonzaga is the top offensive team in this tournament, Baylor's number two, Baylor has the team. They, they have the players to overcome Houston's defense. I think this will be a Gonzaga Baylor final, which will be fun. Should be a shootout. And uh, I'm going to take Gonzaga in the end. They're, they're just the best team in the tournament. Uh, I don't see that changing uh, come early next week. Go ahead, Justin. Well, I, I like Houston to win the next two games and win the national title. I was super impressed with them. Uh, it, it seemed like, you know, everyone was talking about Syracuse, the surprise, the surprise team. And, you know, we'll talk about them more in a minute. But the surprise team that made it back to the – uh, the Sweet 16 and oh the the zone defense that's making everyone look stupid and blah 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 and Houston looked like the varsity versus the JV against Syracuse. Uh, everyone has size, everyone has athleticism, and I would I just came away super impressed with them. Uh, yes, Gonzaga is a juggernaut. Um, it's really tough to go undefeated though, and and any any off day will will cost you and that's the nature of the ncaa tournament that's why upsets happen uh so yes gonzaga is a great team it'd be an unbelievable story if they went on to win it uh, but i just i i like houston you know assuming they they beat baylor i just like that defense i like their athleticism to to kind of carry the day yeah that's that's i could see that happening so all right, so Syracuse, as we uh, discussed a little bit earlier, was eliminated by Houston last Saturday in the uh, Sweet 16 round. And since then, there's been a lot of uh, transactions with Syracuse basketball uh, transfers, including uh, Kadari um, Richmond, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Richmond. And, um, that, you know, a lot of people are concerned. I mean, look, this is the way college basketball works, okay? If you look at any major Division I program right now, there are players transferring in and out. If you, you know, Syracuse just got to transfer in from Richmond. I'm sorry, from Marquette, who's a Syracuse native, okay? Uh, this is like, to me, the equivalent of free agency in college sports, okay? You can transfer, play immediately. It's good for, it's good for the players. Look, Jim Beheim is not everybody's cup of tea, okay? And, um, you know, players, they, they get there. Maybe they don't get as much playing time as they think they're going to, or maybe they don't like Beheim's style, get it. It's, you know, they can leave. That's, that's the way it is. So is this like a, a symptom of a bigger issue? No, not really. Cause this is the way Jim Beheim's always been. It's the way he's always run his program. Okay. Players have come and gone. Matt Rowe left uh, in the eighties for Maryland when he was a hot shot recruit out of Fayetteville Manlius. Okay. There's been a lot of players that have transferred out of Syracuse. It happens. It's part of division one basketball. So, you know, look, Syracuse, they're going to be fine. Are they going to be like a top 10 team next year? No, they're not but they're going to be competitive. They, they have a good chance to make the NCAAs and everything will be fine. So much ado about nothing. Justin, your thoughts about the Qs. The Monday after Syracuse defeated West Virginia, I checked my voicemail sometime Monday night and I had an interesting message that I will read verbatim. This is Jim Beheim. Eat my shorts. Well, how are you doing today? Syracuse has been out of the tournament for a week, my man. Uh, I'm glad that you settled for a sweet 16 appearance, but uh, what happened to Syracuse, uh, even before the transfers, just them getting bounced in embarrassing fashion is exactly the kind of stuff I complained about with that roster leading into the tournament and why I thought they were limited. Yes, the zone gets you so far, and it's tough to play against when you're not familiar with it. But at some point, you need talented players to score you points, to be on the court. A system is only a system. You need to have the talent to kind of transcend the system. And Syracuse didn't have that. Uh, Buddy Bayheim wasn't going to turn into, you know, Adam Morrison uh, for the entire tournament. He was going to have an off game. Uh, and that's ultimately what happened. Syracuse wasn't shooting 75% from three against Houston, and they got crushed. They were exposed for not being a top-level team. So I, 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 I'm with you, though, Chris. I don't, I don't think, like, I'm not throwing my hands up aghast at these, these transfers. 
Uh, I do think it's disappointing that Richmond decided to leave. I was, I think he's a talented player. I would have liked to see how he was going to develop. Um, he's one of the few guys on Syracuse, I think, that has like some creativity to his game that is fun to watch. So kind of a bummer that he's probably going to leave uh, or that he is, he is going to leave. But um, listen, for, for all you Bayheim truthers out there who were, you know, loving life after winning a couple NCAA tournament games, you know, hey, congratulations. If that's your bar, you're happy to get in the tournament and maybe win a game or two, uh, by all means, that's your standard. Uh, my standard for a supposed top tier AC, a ACC team is a little higher. Um, they should be on the level of a Houston, for example. Not that Houston's a year in, year out contender, but there's no reason Syracuse shouldn't have a talented team like that almost every year. They didn't because of Bayheim. Um, they were exposed. Robert? You know, it, it's, it's funny how the view of the Syracuse basketball, men's basketball team has changed over time. Uh, you know, I remember the days when they were a Big East power. They were a, a power in college basketball and a threat to make the final four every year. Uh, even if they did, they, they were a threat to make it because of the program that Jim Beheim built. Now they're on the bubble every year. And I get that, you know, again, I, I mentioned the, the Mets and the tingle that went up uh, people's legs with Lindor. I get that the Sweet 16, you know, uh, you know, was such a great thing, apparently, that, you know, they, they finished as, you know, one of the 16 best teams in college basketball. But is that really what we're settling for now? You know, kind of a, a fluke situation, you know, you you rough up San Diego State. Wow, that's a real battle of the Titans. And then, yeah, I give you credit for beating West Virginia uh, out of the overrated Big 12. But, you know, what, what are we doing here? Don't Have we forgotten what this program used to be? Have we forgotten that this, this was a program that some of the best players, you know, Carmelo, chose to play here. You know, you look at some of the other players that Bayheim has been able to convince to come to snowy Syracuse and spend their winners. And that seems to, some of that luster is definitely gone, if not most of it. Uh, you know, you look at some of the programs, uh, I, I think the NBA one and done rule uh, and, and really the evolution of how players now are choosing to go to say the G League or some of these other leagues instead of college, you know, certainly has an effect, but let's not, let's not forget the role that Beheim plays here too. And especially when it, when we're talking about Richmond, Joe Girard was not good this year. Joe Girard is a shooter. He's not a point guard. Anyone who's watched basketball for as long as Jim Beheim has should know that. And Richmond was by far the better ball handler. And he proved that just in the in the few NCAA tournament games you watched. Joe Girard couldn't bring the ball up the floor without crap in his pants. Richmond, Richmond brings it up and he looks, you know, he's savvy. He, he knows what he's doing. He seems in control of what he's doing. Girard's better off the ball. He's a shooter. Let him do that. Richmond's a point guard. And this is where I think Bayheim really, you know, if you're Richmond, it's easy to see why he, he would leave because you kind of figure what his place is going to be in the program. Bayheim is high on Gerard. Gerard's coming back. You know, it's going to, and, and Buddy Bayheim's coming back. So, you know, where does Richmond fit in that? You know, that, that's, that's a tough thing. And so I don't blame him for leaving. And, but, you know, I, I really think that, you know, Syracuse fans, they have orange colored glasses. Chris, you talk about aqua and orange with the Dolphins. Uh, they have orange colored glasses here in central New York. A lot of them don't want to uh, even criticize this team, this program. You know, I don't think it's fair for the players. This is Bayheim's program. He's running the ship. Look, this isn't the same program that it was even in the 2000s uh, or even back in the 90s, you know, during the glory days and, and further back the glory days of the Big East. You know, a lot has changed. 
And now that they're in the ACC, they're facing some real competition uh, and have been for years, and they're a perennial bubble team. Uh, is part of that because of the ACC? I think so. Is part of that because of Bayheim? I think so. I think that his style has not translated well into this new era of basketball. I'm not going to sit here and say fire Bayheim or anything, but I think people have to be realistic about where this program is. This isn't the same program it was 10, 20 years ago. It's in a much different place, and it's not among the top uh, programs in the country anymore. It's just not. Uh, just before we move on, Chris, I just want to throw in something about, about Gerard, because I, I, I'm with you, Robert. I think he's playing out of position a little bit. Um, but th that's an example of a kid, like, just being someone who obviously I, I primarily cover high school sports and, and following him his senior year when he, he led Glens Falls to state championships in basketball and, and in football. You know, he was the quarterback for, for Glens Falls. Um, you know, it, it did feel like, you know, just as a high school sports reporter, I've never met him. I've never talked to him. Um, but you kind of felt like you had a little bit of a tie to him. And that's a reason to cheer for him. He's, he's a New York state kid who chose to play for, you know, New York state's basketball team. And it's, it's, it's just kind of telling, like, as I think a lot of people also for, for similar reasons, were really excited when he chose to, to come to Syracuse and he was hyped up like he was going to be this uh, this Jimmer Fredette type <laughs> uh, type college player and and obviously he's not and, and yes I think that part of that is because he is a spot up shooter you know he's kind of like you should be setting him up where he's fighting fighting around screens and getting those open looks for three pointers and instead he's he's cast as this ball handler and that's just not that's not his skill set. And I just wonder why Bayheim is kind of being stubborn and trying to fit, you know, a square peg into a round hole when it comes to Gerard. I think he can be a very valuable player uh, if he's used correctly. He's got a couple more years to see if they can figure out how to do that. Yeah. All right. Our last topic, of course, what would our video be without an NFL topic to talk about? So uh, this past week, it's official. The NFL is now going to be playing 17 game regular seasons. Uh, we've discussed this many a time in the past. This is purely a money grab. It doesn't add anything to the quality of competition in the NFL. It doesn't make the game better. In my opinion, I think it actually makes the game worse because you increase the risk for injuries. It's an odd number of games. I mean, it's just, it's a money grab. And, and to me, I get it. The NFL is trying to make as much money as they can. They're a business. I get it. But come on, the NFL is in grind poverty here. They don't need to do this, okay? They're making billions of dollars a year just off television alone. They don't need to add a 17th game, okay? I've always said that, to me, they should do two bye weeks, okay? And, and, and lengthen the regular season that way, okay? So that way, you know, every team gets two buys. They get, they get the rest. They're, it's a better it – makes for a better postseason, um, you know. It just – it's a money grab. And, and, I, and the idea that, like – you know, okay, you're going to have AFC East teams play against NFC East teams corresponding to their position in the standing. So the Bills play the Washington football team. The Dolphins play the Giants. Okay, I, I, I mean, is this going to be rotating every year? I mean, we already have interdivisional play in regards to each division playing against all four teams from another division every year. It's, I just don't like it. It's ham-handed. It's a money grab. It just is – it's a bad look for the NFL – and yeah, it'll probably, you know, they'll make more money. Absolutely. But I just think from a competitive standpoint, it's the wrong move. Go ahead, Justin, your thoughts about game 17. Yeah. And I mean, not, not to rehash the million times we've talked about this before regarding an expanded schedule. Uh, you know, I've been pretty clear. I've been pretty consistent. Uh, I think it's laughable that the NFL is trying to promote player safety and then they add, an additional 17th game. I don't, I don't care what kind of adjustments they make to off season schedules and, mm -hmm. and making sure the players have enough rest and the practice rules and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you're telling players that you guys are going to get in one extra car crash per week. That's essentially what you're, what you're telling them. But I want to say that I think this is important. The players need to be held accountable with this too, because there was a CBA agreement uh, that was agreed upon, you know, last year and the players very easily, 
could have put their foot down and said, no, we are not allowing seven, a 17th game. We are not giving the owners because, because it's kind of worded funny. Like the owners have the option to add a 17th game. Well, excuse my French, but no shit. They were going to do that. Okay. The owners want money. They want more games. If the players were going to allow this to happen, they should have said in the CBA negotiations, you guys need to give us a little more than relaxed practices, okay? How about full-time medical benefits for the rest of our lives? How about that? Because once you open the door for 17 games, you know it's going to go to 18. That's just inevitable at this point. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what the exact language is on how long this CBA uh, has to stay in place before they can possibly move on to 18 games, but it's going to happen. You know, no, this idea of 17 games, having an odd number, uh, it's kind of ridiculous. Um, at the very least, let's go to 18. Why not? You already opened the door. Just do it. So the, the players, uh, once again, are they, they screwed themselves in this. So as much as I want to bash the NFL, uh, a lot of players said, we don't want the 17th game. But when it came down to voting for the agreement, uh, either guys didn't vote or they voted with immediate cash in mind. And for a lot of players that, you know, they might only have three year careers, four year careers. Well, that extra game is one extra paycheck. So it's unfortunate that I think the players were very short sighted in allowing this to happen. Here it is. Now we got to deal with it. Uh, just one more quick thing. I think the rotation as far as like what the extra game is going to be is hilarious. The NFL very clearly uh, decided upon the formula that it did, basically going back to the uh, interconference matchups or the uh, you know op opposing conference matchups from 2019. Because what matchup did we get that year? Packers, Chiefs. Uh, Mahomes didn't play in that game. So if the Packers are going to choke in the NFC Championship every year, and we're not going to get that as a Super Bowl, well, here's a way we can force it into the schedule during the regular season. And I would bet every dollar in my bank account that the Packers and Chiefs will be the opening game for this upcoming season because they don't want to risk Rodgers and Mahomes getting hurt and that game not having quite the same allure as it would have. I you would mean, guarantee that'll be the week one game Thursday night. Well, remember, usually it's the Super Bowl champion who opens well, up. Okay, so, Chris, but a couple years ago, always. Packers Bears Thursday night. There's no, that's plenty true. Of no, you're, no, you're happen, right. So. You, yeah, but, but the thing is, though, we're talking Tom Brady here. You know the NFL wants Tom Brady playing in the first game of the season as the defending Super Bowl champion. There, I, I, you want to bet your your bank account? I'll bet my bank account that there's no way that the Buccaneers are not the opening night game. I mean, they have to be the opening night game, and I don't know their schedule, who they're who they're playing, what their opponents are. But I mean, I'll it, it's got to be the opening game because of Tom Brady. If it was, but Chris, some they, other, they literally yeah. don't. I just said a couple. You know, I mean. no, I get, but. I'm just saying that Tom Brady, they love Tom Brady because he gets TV ratings. I'm sorry. Tom Brady gets eyeballs. Okay? Patrick Mahomes yeah. doesn't get ratings? Aaron well, Rodgers doesn't think, get ratings? No, I'm not saying that he doesn't. But I'm just saying that the, the fact that the tradition the last few years is usually, is usually bad. Not every year, I give you that. But is usually the defending Super Bowl champion hosting the opening game. And it's Tom Brady this year. And you, you know he doesn't have a lot of time left, uh, I would like to think that this will be the opening game. So, Robert, I got news for you. People are sick of Tom Brady. People don't want I'm more. Do you, you think I enjoyed watching Tom? Do you, being a Dolphins fan, you think I enjoyed watching all those games with the Patriots and the Dolphins and what, all the what, what were the What were the Super Bowl ratings this year, Chris? Let me ask you that. What were the Super Bowl ratings? Well, they were lower. That's true. Okay. No, you're right. Okay. But it's still over 90 million people. It's still going to be the most watched television program in the entire country for the entire year. By Super Bowl standard, yes, it was down. But by anything else on television, it's still the most watched program in the United States, period. So, all right. Yeah, but Robert. who played in that game? Tom Brady, Mr. Rating Savior, apparently. <laughs> Robert, go ahead. <laughs> Man, I didn't even have to get it in this. Uh, no, we haven't had a good debate in a while, but hey. <laughs> I, I actually agree with Ritz, you know, on that, on that scheduling point. It, it is pretty convenient that uh, – and obviously they – you know, they, they had the choice to do the interconference and select which division goes up against the other, you know, the opposite division and, oh, yeah, we're going to pick the, uh, the AFC West to go up against the NFC North. I do not think that's an accident. 
And I, I, I agree with Ritz that, you know, it does open the door for that to be the, the opener uh, because- Thanksgiving, look, Thanksgiving look, night, Thanksgiving night. I bet you that'll be Thanksgiving night. Come on, get, you know, listen, I, I get that, you know, you'll be, you know, laying on your couch, you know, bloated from all that turkey no, meat. I'll, I'll be and, and you'll be, and you'll be, and you'll be Excuse looking me? forward to that game. I'll be, I'll be right hey, here hey, on Thanksgiving hey. night. Like I've been for like hey. the last 25 Thanksgivings, but go ahead. Go ahead. You done interrupting now? Yeah, I'm done interrupting. Yeah. All right. Go sit there before I mute you. Uh, <laughs> here, here's, here's what I'm going to say is that it does create you have the reigning NFL MVP, Aaron Rodgers, going up against the golden boy, Patrick Mahomes. You you can talk about Tom Brady like you have Stockholm Syndrome from all the years that he owned our bum teams. But look, th these are the two best quarterbacks in the league right now, Mahomes and Rodgers. Rodgers is the MVP. Mahomes <laughs> is Super Bowl runner-up, uh, was a Super Bowl champ uh, before that, was the N M NFL MVP before that. So you know, that matchup is there, and I don't think it was an accident. As far as the, the structure of all this, uh, to piggyback on what Ritz was talking about, this was a massive failure by the NFLPA to, uh, to give the representation to the players that they needed. They did, instead of defending their players' interests, they became lackeys for the league. And you never want to be a lackey for the league when it's your job to represent the players. And unfortunately, that's what happened here. I think the last time we talked about this, I referenced the uh, ESPN article about D. Marie Smith and, you know, really how it was him caving on this issue that put, put, put the players in this position to begin with. Complete fa failure of the NFLPA because they didn't dig in and say, no, 16 games is it. If you want to make money, let's, let's talk about other ways to make money. Maybe add a bye week, like you were saying, Chris, uh, or add an extra week on. Uh, maybe you look at the playoff structure a little bit. You know, maybe you add some playoff games there. But the 16 game schedule, the the NFLPA did not do their job in defending the 16 game schedule for the players, and that's why we're in this position. You know, I think when I think there were a lot of players that were a bit naive about that agreement. That oh, well, that provision's in there. Uh, you know, we're, we're probably not, that's probably not going to happen though. Well, then the pandemic happens and these teams lose money, you know, the league loses money uh, and this golden opportunity comes up. They get some new TV deals and surprise, they're ready for a 17th game. This should surprise no one. Uh, this was a, the owners that wanted this all along, as you've said, Chris, you know, Ritz, Ritz made the same points. It was bound to happen. I think, you know, 18 games, I agree, it's it's inevitable. That's going to happen. As far as the structure here, you know, I think another gift is, you know, that weak team in South Florida gets to play the Giants oh. this year. What a gift. What oh, a gift yeah. well, to, What you about know. your team? What about your team? Who are you playing? The Washington Washington's a pretty team. good team. Oh, they, oh, oh cool. Pretty good, a pretty good team. Hey, look. Hey, look. Record. They, they were they, seven they, and nine. Seven and nine. Come on. Hey. Don't, don't. Hey. no, 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 no. Remember that game against your beloved Tom Brady and the Super Bowl please. champion Tampa Bay Buccaneers? Huh? Don't go there. Don't go. Don't go there, please. Come on. They don't even have a quarterback. Fitz is their quarterback. For, come on. Oh, come. Fitz is their quarterback. Yeah, listen to this guy. You're closer from last year yeah. and you're acting like he's a bum now. Unbelievable. Okay. What Denny, disrespect for Fitz Denny Magic. Denny. What a clown. Oh, my goodness. Hey, Chris, at, at least Ryan Fitzpatrick can throw the ball farther than 10 yards. Oh, I'm yeah, yeah. quarterback in Aqua and Orange. Don't even, don't even <laughs> be going on. That's another, that's another topic we can talk another time. But, yeah. But, <laughs> look, look, I'm just going to say one thing, Robert. When you talk about the players and, 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 and the NFLPA, look, here's the thing. I think D, D. Marie Smith, the, the executive director of the NFLPA, did not want this. But he has to listen to his membership. And the membership clearly said, we don't want a lockout because we can't afford to lose money. Look, we all know a lot of these NFL players, they like their cars, they like their big houses, they like the trappings of, of being a professional athlete making money, okay? And they didn't want to go without that, okay? I remember a time 
two times in my youth, 1982 and 1987, where players went on strike for, for, for their benefits, okay? Now, the 1982 strike was seven weeks long. You trying to tell me that these players today would go out on strike and miss paychecks for seven weeks? Heck no. And in 1987, that strike was completely different. It only lasted three weeks. And most of the, and some of the players, the bigger players like Lawrence Taylor, caved and, and crossed the picket line. But that's when it all started. When these guys realized, oh, I got to have my money, okay? Which I don't, I don't blame them one bit. It's they're right. But if you want to prevent things like more games in the regular season, or or you want more health benefits, then you got to stick to your guns and say, okay, you're going to do that, then we're going to walk, and then you're not going to have any games, no TV money. And then eventually you're going to cave. The NFLPA, and I'm not saying the executive director, but he had to listen to his membership. And the membership clearly said, we don't want to lose any paychecks. And that's why this happened. Okay. And the NFL knew that and took advantage. And that's labor negotiations. Okay. The owners have the power. It's obvious. They make, they get billions from television. So it's well, I think it's a, they're going to hammer them with that. Well, I think it's important too, to, to point out that, you know, a lot of the criticism like Alvin Kamara came out and, you know, he, he tweeted yeah. something about it, you know, critical of it. While the stars are critical of it, you know, who you're not hearing from are the kickers, the long the rank snappers, your rank and file, who, you know, obviously view this as another way to get a little bit more money in their pockets. These are guys that, you know, they live pretty much at or slightly higher than the league minimum. Uh, and, you know, an extra paycheck for them is huge. You know, they're not going to get a, a yeah. life changing contract. Like, you know, a lot of these guys get that could be hundreds of millions of dollars for them, you know, to be able to make, you know, maybe 10 million in the course of your career is just massive. So, you know, I think that that's something that can't be lost either. I, I to your point, you know, yeah, there's definitely uh, other members here, you know, who, you know, for the rank and file, your long snappers, your kickers, your punters, your your reserve uh, linebackers, you know, your backups. This is huge for them because it's an extra paycheck, and and that might mean something more to them than it would for a guy who's making twenty, thirty, forty million a year. Yeah. Well, we'll wrap it up there, unless Justin's got anything else to add. You good? Uh, I always have more to add, but we've been going almost an hour, so. Yeah. <laughs> All right, folks. It's been it's been fun. This is probably one of the more uh, active uh, videos that we've uh, had in recent memory, but it's been fun as always. Nothing personal, just all for fun here. So, all right, folks. Thanks for joining. I'm Brady us. Lover over here, Chris. You know. Yeah, right. Please, God Almighty, no. Uh, we'll talk about that another time. Hey, thanks for joining us, everyone. We'll see you next week.